Hello, hello. Welcome to the live. For people that are watching, tell me hi, tell me where you're from. <clears throat> Who is here? Tell me hi. Today we're going to be talking about tomatoes. Hello, Remy. Thanks for popping in. Tell me where you're from in the world. I am from Canada in the province of Quebec. I am in the gardening zone 5B. I would say AB. And today I wanted to talk to you about tomatoes. If you know me at all, you know that I'm like really, really, really passionate about tomatoes. And um, I think every new tomato that I can try every year, anything I can sneak in the garden, I just make sure to add it to my garden if I have space every year. So I'm very passionate about tomatoes. But before I tell you anything, of what I know, I would like to know, like I said earlier, where you're from and what are your favorite tomatoes to grow or to buy, to eat and stuff like that. Hello, Ecocentre Constead. Thank you for coming in. Let me know your tomatoes that you enjoy eating. Before I get started to talk about all about tomatoes. I have about four or five years of experiment in growing tomatoes. And I would like to share with all of you what I have learned over the years. Well, this year, 2022 garden, I plan on growing 130, between 130 and 140 tomato plants. And when I say that to people, they kind of go like, you're nuts, you're crazy, where are you going to put all that, what are you going to do with all of that? Well, the answer is pretty simple. I preserve a lot of those tomatoes. I do also eat them fresh, like on salads and stuff like that. But uh, to give you a perspective of the recipes that I do, I do, I can salsa, diced tomatoes, uh, tomato sauce, um, plum sauce for um, cream of tomatoes. Hello, say hi, welcome to the chat. Uh, like I do plum for cream of tomato soup. I do barbecue sauce, pizza sauce, because we eat pizza every single Friday night. I plan on doing chili this year. Uh, I plan on making my own ketchup and my juice. Thank you, Remy, for sharing people's channel. Newfoundland, Canada. I have eight store-bought tomatoes. Started growing them five years ago. Still testing all the varieties. So you haven't found your, like, I'm in love.com variety yet. Is that correct? Okay. <clears throat> Hello and welcome. Now, uh, these are like the things I mainly do. I might try ferment, fermenting again this year, but I was not really in love with the, uh, with the recipes I've made this year. So that's why I don't plan on doing it this year. If I have extra, I might. As of fresh eating, uh, I use it in salads just like that with some salt uh, or some good cheese. I like to do like uh, vegetable salad. So those are the ways that I eat my like fresh tomatoes. I would like to hear about you. How do you eat your fresh tomatoes? Do you have like a special recipe that you enjoy? If you want to share it, please do. While you do that, I will talk to you about tomato basics. Like if you're new to tomatoes, this is where I would start. You need to know the difference between two types of tomatoes. There's determinate and indeterminate tomatoes. The indeterminate tomato is like really self-explanatory. Like if you give it as much space to grow tall, they will grow, grow, grow until the frost kills them. 
there are some maintenance with in indeterminate tomatoes or it depends of your gardening style, but I'll go through that later on. Um, I'm just gonna read the comments. Interesting comment, I don't like store-bought tomatoes. I'm kind of afraid to try one from the garden, but makes me wonder if they would be the same. Uh, Remy, I have bought store-bought tomatoes, the big round ones, and if they're not cultivated into greenhouse, I find that they don't taste very good. So I find that grocery store are very limited for my part. Um, <clears throat> Yes, snow and love variety, but the yellow cherry tomatoes are good straight. You're absolutely right. Uh, I love going in the garden and snacking on those yellow uh, cherry tomatoes. One in particular I like is the sun gold. Now, so I said the indeterminate. Now, the determinate means that you have a certain determined amount of height. It can go from two feet tall to five feet tall. And in that category, there are some that are called semi-determinate. So that means they grow a little taller than the determinate, which is usually two, three feet, four feet. And four to five feet, those are semi-determinate. But some seed companies actually call them in the terminate. So it depends of where you get your seeds. But so you have determinate and indeterminate. And a third class that just started happening is a micro or dwarf tomato. That means that it's going to grow under 30 inch and you can grow them in like six, eight, 10, 12 inch pots. You can hang them in a basket. I am new to this type of tomatoes. This year I am experimenting, I think, with Tiny Tim, Orange Hat. I have four or six varieties of micro and dwarf tomatoes. I will be experimenting this year so I can add that to my learning curve. But it's just a height thing and you can put them in containers. So if you're uh, short on space or you only have containers, dwarf or micro tomatoes can actually be a, a good thing for you. Now, there are a couple of types of tomatoes. You have paste tomatoes which is a sauce type. So that means there's less uh, there's less juice in it, there's less seeds, therefore more meat inside of, uh, of the tomato. So that means you can make tomato sauce, you can make um, diced tomato, salsa, you can even, you can make juice with them, but since there's not a lot of juice inside of the tomatoes, you would actually get less from paste tomato. So if you're looking to make juice, you would have to go with the big slicers tomatoes. Obviously, I just said it, the slicers, they're huge. Some of them are like this big. Some of them are up, can go up to four, sorry, two pounds. And those are for fresh eating uh, burgers, sandwiches, and juice. And some of them, like the yellow, they're very sugary. The, uh, the acidity level is very down, uh, so mixing them in salsas or juice can actually play a little bit with, uh, with the recipe and make it taste better. And then finally, the cherry tomato, like grape, small uh, tomatoes that you can eat them fresh, you can freeze them, you can dehydrate them, you can put them in oil. Hello, is it Angie or Mike? Probably Angie that came in. Uh, hold on. I want to catch up with, uh, messages. Hello, Annie. You love tomatoes. Which one are your favorites? I'm thinking of the golden nugget. I liked the golden nugget. I would say the only down part on my side is that it cracked a lot. Um, I, the taste was good. I just didn't like, did not like the fact that I had to go get them every single time, uh, before eating them. No, I have not tried the 42 days tomato. Maybe next year. Uh, I said hello to Angie. Hello, Marilyn. Yes, it's Angie. Mike is in the doghouse. <laughs> yeah, I watched your video, Angie. I laughed when I saw that. I'm so happy that your second floor is actually, of your house, is actually being built because that means the next step is like maybe a roof over your shoulder soon. Soon, soon. 
Noir de Crimée, I agree. Noir de Crimée is a very good tomato. Slicing in a sandwich or even in salsas, they're very good. Not too acidic. Hello, little homestead by the beach. Okay, I'm caught up with the chat. Uh, so I said that. I took notes, so if you see me watching on the side, I just want to make sure that I I say everything I wanted to say. <laughs> okay, so if you want to grow tomatoes from seeds, there's a couple of things that you need to know. First, you need to find out your, um, your last frost. So for myself, last frost, I just went on Google. I wrote my... Uh, my postal code, last frost, and it gives me an approximate date around May 12th. Anana tomatoes are one of my new five. It's true. I like, uh, there's also, uh, there's another one, uh, I think it's Anana Noir or something like that. It's like a greenish yellow tomato. It's really good. If it's that one you're talking about, it's really good too. Or maybe, I don't know, it's Amana. Oh, I'm, no, I've never tried that one. Where did you get that, Amana? I'm curious now. Okay, so uh, you need to know your last frost. So May 12 is for uh, is for me. So this, I'm just going to give you an example for myself. So I know that I can start my seed six to eight weeks before my last frost. But I'm going to go with a big but with that. Every year, I start my tomato seeds in March, mid-March. My magic number was always March 17. And then I would hope to transplant my tomatoes outside about um, the long weekend in May, which is, I think, May 20th. But then I had like super long, super leggy um, stress plant. And I, and I had terrible, terrible, uh, on certain varieties, terrible uh, harvest with them. So I decided because of the two last year, we had risk of frost at the end of May. Uh, so that was 2021 and 2020. I had to cover about a hundred plants outside every single night for three nights. That was a headache. So I decided to use uh, two weeks after so that means my I use about June 1st. So I put myself that I want to transplant my tomatoes on June 1st. Therefore, I would um, seed them at the beginning of the month of April. I know that everyone right now is looking outside, looking at the white shit we have outside. It's cold. It was minus 30 something degrees this week. And we want to get our hands dirty. But for peppers and tomatoes, especially tomatoes, if you don't want those big leggy ones and a lack of space, I would go on the later than early. So that's why I go uh, about beginning of April to mid-April. Uh, that way I will be able to have smaller plants inside so that they only stay inside for a maximum of six weeks. Past that, you have to up pot them. So usually you would use a three inch pot to 3.5 inch pot if you sow them later. If you sow them earlier, you're maybe going to have to go with a four inch pot, five, six and over. And I grow a lot of my seedlings. So that means I need to count every single space that I have and cherish it. And I also do a sale. So I sell some seedlings for local people around me. So I need to calculate every single space that I have. And that's another reason why I want to save my lights, save space, and isolator. I will have to go check out the MI Gardener site now and maybe <laughs> find those tomatoes. Um... Angie, when are you putting your roof on your uh, on your house? Is it in next week's video? Uh, okay, so I said that. Tomatoes are heat-loving plants inside and outside. So as a requirement, you would need a heat source to get them to germinate. So I have heat mats. Or you can use, if you have a wood-burning stove, you can put them next to your wood-burning stove. And if you don't have a dog, 
or a cat because a cat actually can massacre your seedlings very, very easily. I would put them like a little, not directly on the floor, but like next to the stove so that they can actually emerge from the soil. And from there, uh, people will actually disagree on what I'm going to say, but I'm going to talk about my experiment. Uh, you can use your window seal. I hate using window seal. I prefer using lights. And this is the second investment, which is like the first is the heat mat and the second is the lights. And I would not go with the cheaper ones. Like I, you can go on Amazon, you can go on uh, different websites online and invest in a good light because lights will actually make a difference with your plants. My window seal experiment, my first, first, first year when uh, I started tomatoes, I had, I think, 40 plants my first year, 40 or 45. And I had them on a window seal. And every single day, a couple of times a day, I would move like a quarter inch and rotate my plants. And then like they would like go like this and then I would change them. And then like they were super, super, super laggy, super stressed. So the window seal, if you have like two, three plants, it could work. But if you're growing on a bigger scale, I would invest in uh, some lights. And when I say heat loving plant, it's because if you start them outside and it freezes, your seedlings will die. It takes about five to seven days for a seed to germinate. If you use the mats, you will have better germination overall. So that means less seed wasted. Um, the roof will be on and a bit more of the floor is next. Well, true, you need the, the floor first, yeah. Uh, okay, now. The lights I am using are sun blasters that I have purchased. Uh, a, um, a farm was closing. Um, uh, I, I'm losing my English today. The Micropus. Um, if I remember the name, I'll say it. It was closing down and he was selling all his equipment and I jumped on the sun blasters. And um, hello, Michael Sharp. If you want to tell us about your favorite tomatoes, it's time. I'm going to read your favorite tomatoes and your favorite way how to eat them. So I bought, uh, it was the bulb and the actual grow light. I got them for $10 a piece and it was a good deal. And I bought myself a big amount. So I was able from my second year to get a lot of those lights. So right now it's a good time to look for used or deals because one, they're gonna go back order very fast and on Amazon, some of the prices actually went up. I actually got myself a new lamp to experiment with tomatoes and peppers and blooming um, plants inside. It was $80 on January 1st and I think it's near $100 last week. So the prices are going up. I want to give you a little tip that I have learned in a training I did. A younger, less stress, no root bound plant will produce faster than a super leggy, super stressed plant. And what does days to maturity means? On every seed package, do I have a seed package close by? On a seed package, you're gonna get, you're gonna see in, in the back of your seeds, days to maturity. What does that mean? That means that your plant will take one week to germinate. You're gonna have them inside of your house about six weeks. And the days to maturity is from the day that you transplant them. And like example, this one is um, the Brandywine Yellow. Um, the brand new wine yellow says 75 days. So in optimal conditions from the day that you transplant, you're going to have a fruit within 75 days. Okay. Uh, do I have another one close by that's different? I try to keep mine, uh, days to maturity around, uh, 60 days to 
80 days. The 90 days, sometimes I am lucky. I am able to to harvest the fruits. And um, if I go over 90 days, it's a risk. And thank you. Okay, I click somewhere. Uh, I was looking for microgreens. I bought my sun blasters at a microgreen farm that was closing three years ago. Thank you, little homestead by the beach. No, it was not an auction. It was just he was closing down and uh, he was sick and tired of working seven days a week. He had no employees that wanted to work the hours that it was required. So unfortunately, he shut down. And uh, he was liquidating like a huge, huge greenhouse. It was amazing. I was able to visit it. And it, it's really sad that he closed down. I'm happy because his lost is my gain. But it was sad to see a local company close. Um, yes, thanks, Rams. Don't forget to do a thumbs up for me. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, I said that at this point, do I have any questions of anything I just said? Hello, hello. Are the kiddos more quiet? Danielle? Okay, I'm going to give you like maybe a couple of seconds if you have questions before I move on. Okay, so for transplanting, uh, when, when your plant is about six weeks old, that's when you want to turn around and prepare it to go outside. You just don't take a plant and bring it outside and hope for the best. It's going to burn. It's probably going to die. Uh, and it's going to go within the worst transplanting shock and your plant probably won't recuperate. So I would normally go and introduce my plant a couple of hours late at night. And um, after that, let's just say I start the first night around 5 p.m., I introduce it a couple of hours. And then the next day I go from 4 p.m. and until I go to bed. And then the day after 3 p.m. so that they can slowly get introduced to the natural elements. And also, I did forget to say one thing. Inside, you need some type of fan that mimics the wind inside of your house so that they are semi-prepared to be exposed to their, to their first um, outside period. And after, I would say, I do normally five to seven days of that uh, preparing the plant before transplanting. I plant mine on the week of the 1st till the 5th of January. Obviously, I always make sure that there's no frost in the forecast for the next 14 days when I transplant my tomatoes. I uh, no longer do the Roots and Refuge farm. I put like the, they used to put an egg under their tomato plants because the egg has a lot of calcium. I no longer do that because I have like a skunk that massacred half of my tomato seedlings the year that I did that. And I think I lost, on my 150 plant, I think I lost at least 30, 30 to 40 plants that I had to repurchase. And it was a very sad day <laughs> that day. And I luckily, I was able to relocate the skunk, but I no longer do the egg. What I do now is I use rabbit manure. I just take like a small scoop of dried uh, rabbit manure. I just um, put it in the hole and transplant my tomato. I am sorry, Michael, I do not know what a potash is. Can you explain? Yes, the Osling fan. Uh, yeah, or computer fans if you don't have, but the one that circulate is, um, is the best. Yes. Uh, I usually do 150 to 160, but this year I'm going a different, uh, different way. I will talk about it after. 
No, I don't use the salt. Uh, I do not have um, issues yet with my soil, with potassium. I did have uh, potassium issues the first year that I gardened, especially with my peppers. But after that, I was able to control it and my soil has never suffered from potassium deficiency. But to be, to be uh, on the other side, rabbit manure has a high potassium level from what I read. And I put a hand, like a, a scoop of it under the tomatoes and under the pepper plants. So that's maybe why I don't have potassium problems. Okay, I'm just reading the comments. I want to make sure that I read you. <clears throat> Uh, since I was traumatized with losing almost 40 tomato plants and because um, of the skunk, I have never personally tried it, Equicentric uh, Homestead. I have seen people use it uh, to maybe remove the smell. I would wash them and freeze them and turn them into powder. That can actually maybe work in your favor. But since I, like, I had so much loss with that skunk, I'm never trying anything with eggs in the garden. <clears throat> oh, okay. So Angie, I need to still get a whole new setup for seedling this year. Better get on. Hopefully I can find a deal. Um, I love those Costco shelving units for seed. They're four feet wide, 18 inches deep, and they're 72 inches high. Uh, they are an investment, but lately I have been finding some used uh, around $75 Canadian up to 100 and brand new they go from 150 But I find those ones are sturdier and you won't need to change them over the years. Other than like those little small mini greenhouse, they're like green used, you would get them around $20, $30 brand new. I think they're $49. They're so sketchy. They... They don't last. So I would invest in a setup that you won't have to change every year. My first year, if I if I add up every single thing that I have done over the five years, I probably bought five or six brand new, um, maybe four or five brand new shelves, Angie. <clears throat> Just ash from twigs and branches to amend the soil. Yes, any organic material can amend your soil. But I, I would recommend to do a soil test to see if you lack something. And if you have fresh compost added every fall, in theory, your soil should be good. But the test would actually tell you if you lack something. Hello, welcome. Thanks for popping in. Hey, my friends. Uh, okay, so Annie from Mama Homemade says that she washes her shells, make them dry, and put them into powder. So <clears throat> there you have it. Thank you, Annie, for saying that. <clears throat> now, from transplant, here again is it all depends on your gardener style. I don't have a lot of space, so every single inch is uh, precious to me. So I have my tomatoes in raised bed gardens. They are four feet wide by 15 feet long. Normally, they suggest to, sow, to transplant indeterminate tomatoes 18 inches apart. And determinate, they suggest to transplant it 24 inches apart. When it comes to indeterminate, I transplant them 16, 16 inches apart so I can buy two plants. So instead of transplanting 10 in my garden bin, I am able to plant 12. And the only one that I really respect the spacing is the determinate because if the one plant is sick and it touches the other, the sickness, the sickness can actually go to the next plant. 
and to prevent the sickness, uh, the sickness of my indeterminate plant to go to the next neighbor, I actually prune my tomatoes. I remove the suckers. That's one of them. The sucker is between the plant. There's like a little, little tiny thing. Some people call it the armpit. There's like a little future tomato plants that grows in tomatoes. Like on the, you have the main stem, the side shoot, and it's up here in the triangle. I remove those. And I remove the first eight, I would say 14 inches to 16 inches off the ground. I remove everything so that the, the bottom of my plant can actually have a good airflow. And for my determinate plant, I remove about six to eight inches of the foliage and the suckers from the bottom of the plant. Again, to make sure that there's good airflow and less disease. I find that determinate tomatoes are attacked with disease faster. And by doing removing the bottom of the bottom leaf, I actually have a better success of them lasting longer. I hope I'm not missing anything. Um... Okay, no, 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 no. Plow, plow man was the salt thing. I think Remy explained it. No, sorry about that. Misread. Scratch that. Okay, I caught up. So don't forget, if you have any questions, put them in the comments. And uh, if ever I don't answer them, Remy will actually tell me that I've missed a question. Okay, so uh, the trimming, the pruning of a tomato plant is a question of you. It's not, there's no correct way or wrong way of doing it. I just personally do it to have more plants inside my raised bed and a better overall healthy plant. Uh, okay, trellis systems. This is another way that you can express yourself in different ways. In United States, cattle panel is super easy to get. And I find for indeterminate or determinate tomatoes, cattle panel is the way to go. They are super easy to find in the United States and super cheap. Unfortunately, in Canada, we don't have that option. And Remy, if you have a chance, can you go on Mallory's channel and find the uh, trellis equivalent in Canada for cattle panel so that people can actually see that there is an equivalent if you have time. And the, you can go for, uh, I went with fencing, five feet tall fencing and some T-post. I went with that. I also went with a T in the rope and some clips. I did do some videos about that on my channel, but trellis is very important, especially for indeterminate. For the determinate one, I hate those little triangle cage that they sell at the, um, at the stores. They're useless. They're not tall enough. I would stake them uh, if you don't have access to um, any type of trellis system. When my season is going on, so I make sure to uh, mulch my plants so that my soil can actually retain most of um, the water from the rain or from what I water. Yes, thanks. The um, I was uh, that's a good example. You can stake them with one by ones. Hello, Hedgehog Homestead. I missed. I missed your. Uh, your message. I got my first red tomato last summer. First time in three years. Okay, I kind of lost track of where I was. Okay, so Rem just put the um, the video. This is Mallory from Quebec Homestead. She does a very good video about the equivalent of cattle, cattle panel in uh canada it's it's not the same thing but it's it's a good um it's a good solution so it's a good thing to um remove any unwanted weeds around your tomato plants i companion plant with basil and onions so that they can repel certain types of pests since i don't use any type of pesticides 
And um, from there, I just maintain everything until I have my first flowers and first fruits. If I want to save seeds of a tomato plant, um, I just cover, as soon as I see a bloom, I just cover the bloom and make sure that I hand pollinate that flower and mark the, um, the actual tomato plant. And uh, that's a way to ease, an easy way to collect your seeds from the fruit that will come many weeks later. As soon as I see the fruits, I make sure to go a couple of times uh, that month to make sure that the growth goes well, that it progress well. And if there's not at the, like I try to just a little bit look under the butt of the tomato, make sure that there's no black spots. If you see black spots under your tomato, that's blossom and rot. That means you have calcium deficiency and your soil cannot retain the water. You can correct it by adding, um, some people add eggshells, some people add, um, I add chicken pellets, manure that's enriched in calcium, and I make sure to water really, really well my soil. And in the peak months, so the two to three last weeks of July, and the two first week of August, I make sure that my soil is never dry. So that means uh, I take my, my hand and I put it in my soil. If my finger, like I put like up to here, if my fingers feels wet, that means the roots of my tomato plants has water. If my fingers feels dry, that means there's no water near my roots. Because if you just water the top soil, when the plant is young, you're doing your job correctly. But once your plant actually grows, you have those little roots that goes very deep. And those actually are the ones that need the water. So that's a way of uh, correcting the blossom end route. Unfortunately, that tomato is wasted. I give them to, I remove the black part and I just give them to my, give that tomatoes to my chicken. So it's not a total loss, but that tomato, I cannot eat it. Um, how I harvest my tomatoes. I actually let them ripe as much as I can on the vine, because if I bring them too early inside of the house, my house will look like a grocery store with everything I harvest. I can't keep them more than a couple of days, two, three days inside the house. Last year I had tomatoes all over my kitchen, all over my kitchen table, and sometimes I had some in my living room. I was invaded with tomatoes and peppers and other stuff. So that's why I keep them as long as possible on the vine. The longer they stay, better tasting they will be. And the only time I go and I harvest my tomatoes is if they're super close to being ready and rain is coming. So if rain is coming, the tomatoes will be packed with water and they're going to crack. And they're not going to taste well, even even though if you put them in, in sauce or stuff, it, it's just going to be too watery. So you've lost that tomato again. When that happens, I just give it to the to the chicken. At least someone will be able to get something from that tomato. OK, what did I miss? Yes, the uh, the cattle panel, I think. At my Rona, there were $7 and the rebar, you buy them and just cut them. So it's a really economic way. The only thing is it a rust. So if the rust is an issue for you, the Quebec Homestead cattle panel issue, um, maybe look into a way of painting them, but it is way cheaper than $70. Cattle panel or hog panels here in Canada goes between $50 and $90, which is, which is like rape. Um, really? Alana? You can get cattle panels in Ontario? How are the prices? I'm near Ontario, so I might take a peek. Try a cattle panel idea when I have extra money. Uh, the, the rebar is usually eight feet by four feet. And uh, if you have the um, T-post, it would just be like an investment of maybe $8. Uh, 
if you don't mind the rust. Uh, do you use a question? I kind of don't want to use because of the rust. Yes, well, it all depends. This is a question of preference. If the rust bothers you, well, then maybe this is not the situation. I had purchased 100 feet of fencing before I found out about these this solution. I have to go check that out. Three years ago, we got wind stakes for a dollar. I Everything went up. Uh, I wouldn't know. I wouldn't think that it's a dollar. It would probably be a little bit more expensive than, than that. Okay. The rust shouldn't hurt, but I do use because I'm a boy with little money. Got to use. and True. True. You, when you garden and your your finances are super tight, use what you have on hand and make it work. That's that's how I started uh, five years ago. Like me and my husband used to, to to laugh. We would call ourselves rednecks because we just reused, recycled. We were shopped for things that were free when when we started to make sure that we can make this work. Um. Yes. Those panels can be found at scrapyards. Uh, yeah, yeah, but I find that at scrapyards, they actually keep those things for themselves. Hello, let's see if I can pronounce your name this time. Northern Berlin Acres. Close, close enough. Hello. We got three candle panels at the feed store two years ago, and they were $50 at that time. Mmm, that's still expensive. For, f I think it was $69 or $75, I got 50 feet of um, fence, five feet fence. Mm -hmm. Okay. I will, thank you for sharing. I will keep that in mind. The cattle panel and rebar are good because the holes are big. I use chicken wire and tomatoes. <laughs> yeah you would have deformed tomatoes that happened to me a couple of times last year i did not see that a tomato was squished in my in my panel and uh sometimes they explode <laughs> and i had some surprise um uh, tomato seedlings that were popping out hello hickory farm thanks for passing by happy sunday i got cattle panel whoa 70 dollars i was saying that i was saying that's expensive really expensive Okay, I'm caught up. The trellis, I would say, is another investment. But once it's bought, you no, you no longer need to make the investment. And, well, if, if, if you go from 40 tomato plants to 100 tomato plants, you might need to buy more. But usually when you have like a good amount of numbers, like you no longer need to buy that um, that product. Do I have any questions? My very first garden fence was made from storm wood after the ice storm. We weaved the branch. It must have been beautiful. It must have been really beautiful. <clears throat> the cow panel have gone up in price. They are 16 feet long and 50 in. Okay, okay. So they are bigger. The ones that uh, are in the United States, they're eight feet long by four feet wide. Hello, guys, on my phone, so no tagging, but hope that you all have a great weekend. You too. I hope you had a great weekend. I love stringing my tomatoes in the greenhouse. It would be nice if I could string them outside too. Um, I string mine in my greenhouse. I have semi-determinate five feet tall in my greenhouse because my high tunnel is shorter on the sides. Outside, I created a T, like a, with a piece of wood. I took two strings and I would string them down. Uh, I, if you want, I can message you um, personally um, 
the way I did it with the strings. It's possible to do it outside. You just need to do a T and pass a wire. Okay. <clears throat> My sky does not have hooks. Yeah. <laughs> it's unfortunate. It's unfortunate. Unfortunate. You're welcome. We have candle panel panels. They work great and last forever, but we are going to try the stringing for some this year. I love the uh, candle panel, but I also enjoy the string. Uh, if you don't have like a lot of money to invest, the string is super easy. You can just slap on old, old pieces of wood and get yourself a sturdy wire and the clips are not that much uh, expensive. I um, I'm sorry. I'm probably gonna massacre your name, Plowman Backyard. Um, I found my ideas on Pinterest. Okay, now once I have harvested uh, my tomatoes, like I said, I keep them about a couple of days inside my house, and then I process them. And uh, you can eat if you don't have enough, you can freeze them and then use them later when you have more of a harvest. At the end of the season, uh, it's green tomato season and the frost is coming. So you have a couple of options. You can remove all your green tomatoes and bring them inside and let them either turn red, which will take maybe, a, I would say, at least a week. Uh, or you can do green salsa or green recipe, green tomato recipe. I don't personally do it, but a way that I actually found to make my season last a little bit longer, there are some row covers, frost row covers, and I just cover my plants and I deep water my beds. I make sure that they are really, 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 really wet. The soil is really wet. And I put those covers on top and you can maybe buy yourself a week, two weeks if we're lucky, and you can get your tomatoes to ripen on your vine. One of the reasons why I don't make my green tomatoes turn red is I find that they're too high in, a, like it's too acidic. And my tomato sauce, I would have to add a lot of sugar to actually make it like the the ones that I do at the early of the season. Uh, if you have green tomato recipes that you either eat fresh or you preserve, you can talk about it here if people are curious. And at the end of the season, I probably have like between 50 and 60 pounds of green tomatoes. Uh, I just bring them inside the, um, the greenhouse, hope for the best, and... It's it's a lost uh, it's a lost for me, but I give them to the chickens. So usually, if everything is done, all my recipes is done, everything I wanted to can preserve, freeze, dehydrate is done. I would let them turn red and give them to the chickens. But that's personally for me because I don't like the taste of green tomatoes turning red. Um, we are planning to build a beam one to inset post very versatile as you say and we have a ton of baller twine yeah that's what i i diy mine but that's pretty much what it what it is salsa is the reason i want tomatoes but my daughter eats them faster than apples you have to grow more i did spicy green tomato pickles this year hmm could try it could try it Okay, trying to catch up on the messages. Crazy. They would all be flattened, but he was super happy to see all standing. We watched a video on how to do it. Okay, so that's not it. The sound. sound. Yes, it does sound tasty. Okay, so one one thing I wanted to say at the at the beginning, I talked about I was growing about 130 to 140. Why did I go down? I usually grow 150 to 160. Why did I go down? 
uh, I wanted to grow other other type of food like peppers uh, and other stuff. So I cut down for that reason. Also, I cut down on slicers, those big red colorful ones. I cut down on those because what I used to do is I was not able to eat them and I would um, fast enough. I would put them in my sauce and in my sauce, there would be too much water. In my salsa, there would be too much water. Therefore, I was standing on my stove for hours, my gas stove and use gas to remove all that water from my tomato sauce. So I cut down on those. So the slicers, I cut down a lot, which is sad, but it was a necessary evil. I upped my paste style tomatoes for sauce, for bar especially for sauce. And I found that now, uh, I used to hate doing diced tomatoes with the slicers, the big slicers. I found that they were not uh, holding themselves together like the, the the ones that you would buy at the store. And after doing a lot of reading, I found that paste style tomatoes are easier to just remove the skin and dice them and they hold themselves just as the store bought. So now my diced tomatoes will be made with um, paste style. And since like I will be eating pizza every single Friday night, well, I need a lot of tomato sauce. <laughs> So that's why I went in that direction. And I have the third reason is I want to go in the self-sufficient. So I want to become self-sufficient on many things. And tomatoes is one of those. So I have to go with the, in that in mind, I have to grow more tomatoes. Not well, obviously I want to grow them for the beauty, but I have to put down that side and up the ones of produce like being productive so that means i also had to educate myself on prolific varieties early varieties and the ones that are adapted to my northern climate so those all of that together came to the number of about 130 140 i'm still not done preparing my tomato list but like it gives like i know that i have space for about 130 140. Mm, did I miss any comments? Mama, homemade, we have done done it two years in a row. We get tomato twine from a company in Quebec called Dubois Agri. Novation, super cheap and really tough twine. Cool, thanks for sharing. Um... You love tornadoes. Can you explain? <laughs> I just want to know the meaning of that, but uh, not the ones that cause people. Oh, true. Okay, okay, now I understand. What would be the second? What would be the second most grown thing in your garden? Peppers. <laughs> I love peppers. I'm not as an expert in peppers. Last year was my biggest success as peppers. So this year will be the test of um, for peppers. I want to grow from 160 to about, I'm guessing it's 60 to about 100, but give, give them more space. Is that what you wanted to say? Okay, space. Uh, you can still have some good varieties with tomatoes. Thought given and separation distance for seeds are not as difficult. You can still have some good varieties with tomatoes, though given the separation distance for seeds are not as difficult to meet as other vegetables. Generally, it's true. It's easier to save the seeds. But um, I have such a small space, and I'm the only one taking care of the homestead. Seed saving is unfortunately not on the top of my list of priorities i do try to save seeds as much as i can and just put those little um organza bag on top of my tomato plants as soon as i see a bloom but i get so much harvest at the same time that sometimes i just can't manage Uh, yeah, we are bad for crowding the tomatoes. <laughs> okay. I bought some cowboy cracks from 
a, a few weeks ago, now I must grow several ha jalapenos. Jalapeno, I don't grow a lot of jalapeno, hot peppers here. My family, like me and my husband eat hot peppers, but unfortunately my kids hate hot peppers. So I have to make a salsa recipe for them and a salsa recipe for us. So when it's taco night or um, anything with salsa, I always have to use, if, if for everyone, I have to use the kids salsa all the time. <clears throat> yes, my tomato starts out great, but do get out of hand by the end of the summer. Yeah, well, uh, I'm not sure if you were there uh, when I talked about pruning. Uh, I actually make sure to prune as much as I can uh, my indeterminate tomatoes to make sure that I can keep on top of them. But at one point, I totally lose control and they become like humongous monsters. But I try as long as I can to maintain them. Um, okay. Now I'm going to tell you my, uh, varieties that I enjoy the most. If you want to share the varieties that you enjoy, please do. Uh, for my paste tomatoes sauce and stuff like that, I still have not found my in love, but I do enjoy the Jersey devil and the Amish paste. They are huge tomatoes. They taste good. And uh, for now, they're they're doing the job for me. Uh, for slicers, I am a yellow or black uh, tomato. I like the Black Prince, the um, pineapple, and the Old German. Those are my preferred uh, big slicers. And for cherry tomatoes and snacking, I just love the Sun Golds and the Black Cherry. Those are like the ones I go outside and after a very long day in the garden, I just wash them on my shirt and uh, eat them right off, right off the vine. Um, if you don't like hot peppers, there is one that's called nada peño and habanada. They are exactly as a jalapeno and a habanaro, but with without the heat. I'm just reading the comments to make sure that I'm not neglecting you guys. Uh, okay, that's not mine for me. I agree, Annie. I haven't found my favorite paste yet. No, I haven't fell in love um, yet. Uh, this year, I'm trying new varieties of paste, but um, I don't know. I still don't know. Do I have them with me? No, I think they're downstairs. I'm trying the Roprico. Ropeco, Ropec, something like that. Jardin de Cumen has them. And Ten Fingers. Those are the ones I'm trying this year. Um, we shall see. Never heard of the Jersey Devil. Have to take... Uh, Jersey Devil, Jersey Devil, Jersey Devil. I have them. Uh, da -da 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 -da. Where are they? Uh, Baker Creek has them. Uh, M.I. Gardner has them. Uh, they're pretty big. Massive paste variety. These acidic cylindrical tomatoes grow prolifically and can grow up to six inches long. Very flavorful. Perfect for use in sauce and salsas. So that's the Jersey Devil. Baker Creek also has them. <clears throat> Sun goals are awesome cherry tomatoes. Yes, I know they're hybrids. I can't save the seeds. Uh, oh, I did forget to mention that. Hybrid is not like genetically modified alien ah, type of shit. Hybrid only means that parent A was mixed with parent B and the fruit from the, those parents created a hybrid. Actually, hybrids happened by accident. And when we save seeds, we actually maybe sometimes save some hybrids. When a seed company sells hybrid, it just means that they have um, every single time. It's a, it's a true hybrid. And you're going to get the same sun gold every single time that um, you sow those seeds. But you just can't save that seed thinking you're going to have the exact tomato. It's going to be either parent A or parent B if you save the seeds. 
we love the black prints. I love the black prints. Uh, I can't remember who suggested that. I tried it last year. They're little tiny tomatoes. It's perfect for a sandwich, for, um, I would say, burgers or any type of sandwich. You can just slap that on. It's really nice. This year, I'm trying the Tom Soul again. Uh, unfortunately, I, uh, my plant died last year, so I wasn't able to try it. I have never tried Squishia. San Marzano, I have a very bad luck with those. They always have blossom end wrap, but not at the bottom, inside. I don't know why. We have a few cherry plum types. We like two. Uh, my favorite pepper to grow is banana pepper. Me too. I did this year for the first time marinated um, pickled banana peppers uh, with mustard, mustard seeds and uh, garlic. And I put those on my pizza. They're super delicious. I have to make like a ton. So this year I'm growing a gazillion banana pepper. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry, I'm losing my voice. I see and hear all these tomato names. <coughs> Until last year, I thought there were only like, no, there's more than three, four types. Black Beauty. Uh, I've never personally tried it. I tried uh, Blue Beauty. I did not like it. But from, the, from everything I was re reading, the black one was better. <clears throat> Uh, welcome. Yes, true. When I started with tomatoes, I thought like, just like Remy, that there was like a couple of type of tomatoes and they were no fun. And then I met Jessica from Roots and Refuge Farm. God, my collection went from like five tomato plants to like, I won't say the number, but a, a lot of tomatoes. Like I have a lot. Uh... Oh boy, Remy, don't go there. It's crazy thing. You want to try them all. It's true. It's addictive. And a friend of mine, Marie Clone, uh, when I order seeds, it's, it's now a running gag. She says, how many tomato seeds did you order now? Mm -hmm. how, how, how many of those are you actually going to plant this year? And she makes fun of me. Yes, I can't wait for you to try it, Annie, and talk, uh, uh, and talk about it. I was very curious about that tomato. Thank you, Remy, for reminding for reminding me. Uh, don't forget to do a thumbs up for me in this live. Sounds interesting. That was one thing we found with the Amish paste. We were was the yes. Well, for tomato sauce, it was okay. Um, that's why I say I'm not in love with the Amish paste. I love the fact that it's prolific, huge, and it makes my life super easy for diced tomatoes. But I haven't found that big, big, big paste tomato that has like a balance between a, like the acidity and the fruitiness of a tomato. I'll find it. I'm sure one day I will find my go-to paste tomato. <clears throat> hybrids are grown specifically to breed out certain problems. It's true. It's true. Uh, hybrids are, are made to help out big scale gardeners, especially when they have a lot of pest disease. Uh, hybrids are usually disease resistant, heat resistant, cold resistant. So at the end, you're getting a better overall uh, plant with a hybrid. The only downside is you can't save the seeds. Uh, are those one that, okay, that's not for me. Yeah, generally keep stock of both the parent varieties and cross them very, it's true. I could do that. I could do that. I don't, I, I don't think I would have the time to do it, but one day, once I get everything efficient, maybe I can cross pollinate my own tomatoes. That would be fun. Um, <clears throat> I have seeds if you want. That's not for me. Yes, we fine. Like I, the ones, the San Marzano and the Roma that I buy at the nursery every year, I always have that problem. They have the blossom run rot inside. And I don't know why. They are watered the same as the others. I don't know. I would really want to know why. 
Thanks again. Hello. I bought some that I thought might be similar. I save a few seeds that last year. Man, they are the best. Okay, that's not for me. Uh, I grew... Oh, this is a new one. Coeur de Bleu from Burton Seed last year and love them. Hmm. I actually have a new variety to go investigate. You can save the seed of a hybrid. Yeah, I, I said that earlier. Uh, you're just not going to get the true seed. You're going to get parent A or parent B. You're going to get an actual tomato. You're going to get food. You're just not going to get that exact specific uh, hybrid seed that you've purchased. Well, cross-pollination can be difficult, but it, you can do it. You can try it. Worst case scenario, it won't work. Okay, I'm up to date with comments. Uh, do I have questions? I am gonna, I have one more thing to share. It's tomato math, how I came up with my magic number of 130 plants, 40 plants. I'm just gonna give you maybe a couple of seconds if you have questions for me. I'm gonna grab water. I think I'm gonna lose my voice tomorrow. It's not wine, it's beer. <laughs> and the other, this is not wine. You thought this was wine? This is water. <laughs> yeah, it would bring a liter of, of wine inside <laughs> my room. <laughs> okay, so I get this question all the time. How many tomato plants should I grow? I can't tell you that. I can't tell you that exact number that you need. I will never be able to actually answer that question. The only thing I can give you is you have homework to do. You need to figure out the recipes that you want to preserve. You need to figure out what you want to eat fresh, when you want to, like what type of preserving you want to do to figure out those numbers. After that is done, like you wrote that you want to eat salsa once a month. Well, you look, you go find a book, a canning book, canning recipes, and you figure out how many jars that gives you. Usually it's more or less if it says five jars, sometimes it's going to give you four and a half. Sometimes it's going to give you five and a half. So it's going to give you a good idea of how much one recipe will do. And then you figure out how many times you want to do that recipe to give you salsa once a month. Like I will be eating about once a week pizza. So that means I need 50 time one cup of pizza sauce. So that means I need to do a certain amount of times my recipe to give me those 50, um, 50 times one cup. So I've written down in my, uh, in one of my notebooks, how much of each I want to have, and then I went and I Googled a couple of years back how much a healthy tomato plant will give me. So a healthy plant means in the ideal condition, the watering schedule is top shape. So your tomato plant is at its best. A tomato plant will give you about 10, 15 pounds of tomatoes. It's an average. You can have a little bit more, a little bit less, but it gives you a good perspective. It takes six pounds of tomato paste to make one liter of sauce. And those are approximative, like they're not exact to the science. It's just to give you a good idea. So if you go and you plant outside in your garden, 30 types of paste style tomatoes, you're going to get about a little bit over 300 pounds of tomatoes. And that will give you about 50 liters of tomato sauce. So if you want to eat one liter of sauce, tomato sauce, every week, you need about 30 plants of tomatoes. But if you like me and you decapitate some of your tomato plants when you're pruning, your kids are trying to help you out, they kind of kill your plant or accidents happen, I always tend to plant a little bit more. 
So I made that calculation for every single recipe that required a big amount of tomatoes. And that's how I came to my big number of about uh, 80 paste style tomatoes. And the rest will be my slicers and my cherry tomatoes. Also, you need to make another uh, homework. You need to figure out how much space you have in your garden to make sure that you can you have enough space for your tomatoes. Another calculation I've made is sometimes they're going to talk about diced tomatoes. So I wanted to have, I'm going to give you a number here. I wanted to have 50 jars of two cups. So two cups of diced tomatoes is about a pound. So I know that I need about five plants that will give me about 50 pounds. So I like all of that is homework that needs to be done. And once you figure out that magic number, you write it down and you make a garden journal for tomatoes and you evaluate your year. You write, you take down notes of the varieties you've enjoyed, the ones that you hated, the one that you want to try, the things that you did not enjoy, the things that you enjoyed, the things that you want to modify for the future years. So that means when you sit down for your next season and, um, you're going to see, okay, how much food do I have left in my pantry? Do I need to grow more? Do I need to grow less? So that magic number will happen over years of practice. So I'm going within my fifth year, and I think I'm confident with the number that I have reached, and it's going to be the confirmation at the end of the year. So that's a little bit tomato science for you. Uh, da, 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 da. No, it was not a glass wine. It's a um, it's a glass that my husband had a long time ago. It's Stella Artois, fancy beer glass. We had a variety of tomato we got in a seed swap, and they were crossed, i.e., not pure. It was interesting. They were edible, but not great and lost diversity of form. Flavor, taste did not work out well. It's true. Sometimes cross-pollinated can actually give you not what you wanted. The Coeur de Bleu means ox heart in English. Oh, I've tried ox heart. They're huge. I've tried the white one and the pink one. They're humongous and they taste really well, but they crack. That's the only side... I would say bad side. So if you want to grow those ox heart, uh, you need to watch for the rain. And if my memory's correct, there's a yellow one for the ox heart. How many to grow? Too many. Better to have extra. <laughs> yeah, it's true. It's true. It's hard to find the number. Also, I did forget to mention, you need to evaluate how many people you're feeding and the age of the people you're feeding. Cause I have three young kids. My plan might get bigger once my kids, I have two boys reach 13, 14, 15 year old, where they actually devour the entire pantry within a couple of weeks. So my, my magic number might change over the year. <clears throat> Wow, I got like three tomato per plant last year. So definitely it comes back to what I said earlier. Your plants were very stressed. And when you came to transplant them, they had to recuperate from that stress. Therefore, you kind of missed out on tomatoes. So start them later than you would usually. I think I sent you the uh, Johnny Seed planting calendar the other day. Could be something useful to look Oh, uh, da, 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 that is a good point. Ecocentric homestead. That is one nice thing about tomatoes. They are forgiving. It's true. They're very forgiving. They're waiting for me. I remember I decapitated one uh, seedling and um, I just removed the, uh, the root part and I cut some of the foliage. I stuck it in water and uh, that head of my tomato plant rooted and I just transplanted that. Obviously it was a smaller plant, but I was able to revive that plant. You can also do that with suckers. 
once a sucker is about seven, five to seven inch long off of the tomato, you cut it, remove foliage, uh, extra foliage. You make sure to keep the head. You put it in water and you will be able to get new suckers. Earlier on in the season, I would say June, beginning of July, you will have fruit. Not a very prolific plant, but you will be able to get a couple from those plants, from those suckers. <clears throat> uh, have fun thanks for popping in good night plow man's backyard i'm probably massacring your name i'm super sorry well i've said everything i've know about tomatoes uh do I need to answer questions? We lost 67 plants last year as we had late snowfall. Oh my God. Oh my God. You were hit with the frost. We replanted, but this year we will plant later. Yes. Um, at the beginning of the live, I did mention that uh, I would usually transplant my tomatoes uh, around May 20th. And this year we came super close from frost on May 29th, 30th, and 31st. And I had to cover like multiple rows of tomatoes. This year I am, uh, I am in zone 5. My frost date is May 12th. I now will start planting them early April, mid-April instead of mid-March so that they only stay six weeks inside from the day that I plan on transplanting them. So I just, I went from June 1st to June 5th. Those are the time that I want to transplant them. And I backed up about six weeks and I will start my seeds around that time. Oh, yeah, I save tomato seedlings from dampening off like that. Decap yeah, it's true. Like a, a plant of tomato, before you throw it out, before like you say, oh, my God, I've killed it, try to save it. Like you can cut the, if like uh, the, the root are either um, rotten, root bound or stuff like that, and you want to try saving it, uh, try it. You're going to learn from this experiment. Even though if it's an epic failure, you're going to learn from that experiment. <clears throat> do i have questions it's always a big of a gamble that plant out time it's true it's true it's a very big gamble we usually are lucky planting end of may for tomatoes but we have it if you have row covers like i bought some last year uh in case i get caught Row covers can actually save your plants. But if it's like, if it goes from zero to minus 10 degrees Celsius, I'm not sure that cover will actually save your plants. But it like, that's why I no longer do it. I've been, I've been caught the two last year with covering over a hundred plants and it's time consuming. And with the little ones going to school and taking care of everything, it was like time management and my plants suffered from it. So that's why I no longer, I no longer do it that way. Um, okay, this is another debatable question. Uh, I'm going to put it here. I multi sow my tomato plants because of space management and I very de delicately separate my tomato seedlings and I up pot them. I have a very hard time cutting a seedling, thinning. Like it's, it's very hard for me to thin a seedling and kill it because it's a tomato plant and it's my passion and I love tomatoes. So I try to separate them as slowly as possible, as young as possible to make sure that when I transplant them, I save them all. Sometimes I do lose them, but I try to save them all. <clears throat> I actually do that with carrots also. I have a hard time thinning carrots like I let I let the carrots come a little bit like like a little tiny tiny carrot like a snacking one and I just remove them so that at least I get some food out of it I don't kill it <laughs> I know like 
salads and stuff like that. Like I have, there's so many seeds that come in the package. Like I might thin, but um, tomatoes are pretty for, pretty forgiving. Peppers, I, I I try to only sow maximum two seeds per cell to make sure because peppers are a very delicate plant. Uh, we don't usually thin tomatoes, but do some on other, but try to minimize if we can. <clears throat> it, it's hard. It's hard. Like you, you plant a seed and you probably go on, on that seed cell and you probably look at it for hours and say, come on. And then you kill it. And it just, it just defies the purpose for me, but I know it's necessary on certain things, but I try not to. I start mine in tiny cups, one per seed. If if your seeds are pretty young, that's good. Uh, usually the uh, seed companies sell you good, uh, good quality seed right off the bat. If it's not, if the germination rate is lower, it actually says it on the packet of seed. But I usually plant at least two. Some of my seeds are about five years old now, so more the older your seeds are, sometimes your 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 germination rate goes down a little bit. But usually one per cup would suffice. But with everything that I grow and with the plant cell that I have, uh, I try to maximize all the space that I have to grow the seeds. And I am trying two ways to start seeds this year. I am trying soil blockers in 72 plug trays. And I think it's 128, the one after that. I'm not sure. It's 124 or 128. I'm not certain. But the 72 plug trays are very, very popular at my house. And I would like to try and perfect my experiments with soil blockers. I am happy to have you. Have a wonderful evening. I hope you learned a lot. Ah, uh, I, I never thin. I always transplant. It's what's true. Whatever you thin, you can try to save. It's true. It's true. But I have a hard time killing a plant. I, I have a hard time. Uh, yeah, there's always a pl place for an extra plant. Last year, I maximized every single inch that I could because uh, of that, because I had some leftover from my plant sales. So I snuck in a couple of plants here and there, got some food out of them. But uh, yeah. Extra plant, you can either find a spot, you can do container gardens, gardening. I actually have, uh, for my extra plants, I bought some grow bags. I have a couple 25 gallons and a couple uh, five gallons. And I try just to snuck them in there. Or I bring them to my dad, which I converted into a gardener. And if he doesn't want them, I try to give it to someone that would like it. I try to find a place for it. I do not want to put it into the compost pile. <clears throat> with cups, the cups without plants get removed. No waste. It's true. It's true. You have to find a... I can tell you how I set up. But it's not... Not my setup will not maybe fit somewhere else. Like, uh, I was able to find uh, cups for very... Uh, containers for very good deal. Another place was closing down. And he was giving... I think it was like 10 cents or 15 cents a cup. Uh, so, nurse, nursery grade uh, used um, containers. So, I was able to get a lot of them. So... And I have the soil blockers, so I, I was able to get a lot. But my system does not mean that it's the only system. There's so many, so many systems out there. And I love hearing about the others because when I watch the others, it actually gives me ideas to actually make mine a little bit better the year after. Do I have other comments, other questions? 
It's almost magic hour for my kids. It's 7.25. When 7.30 happens, they go kaboom. I, <laughs> they go nuts. Ever use those mini domes? No. Uh, you mean the one, the plastic ones, transparent that you put over the... Um, over this, the, the, the tray, the seedling tray, is that the one you're talking about? <clears throat> I don't use, if it's that one, I don't use those domes anymore. I used to, to help with germination because I did not have a lot of seed mats, but I had some funky things growing on the side of my flats. Um... Oh, someone wants to say hi. This is Tio, my sidekick. Uh, I had like funky thing growing on the side of my flat. I didn't like it. And in the, um, I followed um, Fruit and Seed Academy. And the first thing that they said is not to use it for like mushrooms and stuff like that. And if you want to use them as soon as you have germination to remove it. No, I've like I, I like I don't use the domes. I rather since I have so many seedlings at the same time, I try to keep my system as easy as possible and those domes like I I would have to lift them, put them uh, put the water and then put it back and since like sometimes I have like 20 to 30 flats to water at the same time, it was too time consuming. So even before I followed the uh, training, I stopped using them. <clears throat> you would fit one dome per plant. Ugh. Oh, those, you're talking about the domes for outside for frost. Yes, you could use those, but um, make sure to remove the domes before the sun comes back up because you can cook your plant. Because if it's 10 degrees outside, under that, it's maybe like 5 to 10 degrees higher. So you could actually burn your plant. I did not get those. <clears throat> Since I have my high tunnel... I try to put the things that need a little bit of, like my precious plants, like sp specific tomato plants and pepper plants. I put them in my high tunnel. So it's a big dome. <clears throat> and um, if I have to, uh, if I have leftovers, I put them in my grow bag. And my grow bags, I just pull them inside the greenhouse. Yeah, there's different tricks for late frost. Late frost, there's the row covers, those, those, you can put um, those little domes, but the best is to have a greenhouse. And if you can um, have the grow bags and just bring them back inside the greenhouse. <clears throat> yes, you have to build your greenhouse, Remy. Build it. If you guys don't have more questions for me, I'm going to have to let you go. It is the magic hour, like I said. I can hear the kids in the basement. <laughs> I mean, in the uh, downstairs. <clears throat> I will wait one more minute. If I can see any more questions, I will answer them. I would like to thank you for listening to me tonight. I had... Um, no idea it was going to last an hour and a half. I thought it was going to be 30 minutes and be done with it. So I thank you for listening to me, for commenting, for doing the thumbs up, for supporting me in this unconventional journey. And thank you, Remy, for being the mod uh, for helping me with the comments and tagging everyone, uh, everyone that had a channel. So if you're curious to go check out similar uh, content, uh, channels or any other types of ca content you can check Remy tagged everyone and everyone have a good week and for the parents that their kids are going back to school tomorrow good luck tomorrow morning I'm gonna stay one more minute like I said to see if there's any more questions I don't think there are any questions.
maybe 30 seconds more. Okay, well, I'm going to let you guys go. And thanks again. Take care. Bye.